Good evening. I'm Harold Holzer. I have the privilege of serving as director of the Roosevelt House. And it's a pleasure tonight on behalf of myself and Jennifer Rabb, the president of Hunter College, to welcome you to another of our Roosevelt House forums for candidates for citywide and local office in the June 22nd primary. This is the third discussion in our series. These gatherings engage candidates with a series of questions from young and first time voters, especially Hunter students, as well as the broader Hunter community. This event, as we begin Pride Month this very day, will appropriately be focused on LGBTQ issues. On June 22nd, as I'm sure most of you know, it will be our collective responsibility and opportunity to use that most essential of democratic tools, our vote, to bring about a healthier and more harmonious future for all. For tonight's event, we invited the 2021 candidates for mayor and comptroller to join us. And some intriguing aspirants have responded for this evening's individual discussions of how each of them would lead on behalf of New York's LGBTQ community. Candidates, we could not be more grateful that you are here with us tonight. By speaking to us about your vision for LGBTQ rights and equality and for fairness for all gender and sexually diverse New Yorkers, you help us all to live up to the perpetual promise of our historic hunter motto, Mihi Kura Futuri, the care of the future is mine. We look forward to hearing from each of you as we endeavor together to care for New York's future. There could be no better host and moderator for tonight's event than the Roosevelt House LGBTQ Policy Center, which we're especially proud to say has its own brand new and visionary leader, the amazing Aaron Mayo Adam. Aaron is the author of Queer Alliances, How Power Shapes Political Movement Formation. She is the author of Queer Alliances, How Power Shapes Political Movement Formation. She's a rising star in Hunter's political science department and a member of the Roosevelt House Public Policy Faculty and Curriculum Committee. So Aaron, thank you for your hard work in organizing this event and for leading tonight's discussion and welcoming tonight's extraordinary students. Before I hand the program over to Aaron, who will provide fuller introductions of our participants as each candidate joins, I'll briefly welcome all of tonight's guests. They are Art Chang, finance executive and Democratic candidate for mayor, Michelle Caruso Cabrera, Democratic candidate for comptroller, a former financial journalist, Zachary Iskell, Democratic candidate for controller and a former Marine. Brad Lander, Democratic candidate for controller who currently serves as city council member from Brooklyn's 39th district. Fernando Mateo, candidate for mayor in the Republican primary. He is a restaurateur and president of the New York State Federation of Taxi Drivers. Alex Pan, Democratic controller candidate and a college student at Denison University. And Reshma Patel, seeking the Democratic nomination for controller and president of the Eleanor Roosevelt Democratic Club of Manhattan. Candidates, we welcome you. We welcome you to the virtual Roosevelt House stage, and we look forward to a lively and illuminating event. And now to bring on the first candidate, I'm delighted to turn things over to the new director of the Roosevelt House LGBTQ Policy Center. I'm handing the mic with pleasure to Erin Mayo Adam. Um, hello, uh, welcome everyone. I'm delighted to moderate today's forum with candidates running for a citywide office in the June 22nd uh, primary election in New York City. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to very briefly describe the format. Uh, because the candidates are from different races across the city, Hunter College students and I are going to speak with the candidates one at a time, and this will ensure that each candidate has the chance to address the issues and plans particular to the office they seek. And each candidate will get 10 minutes. 
Now, without further ado, I'd like to begin uh, with Art Chang. Uh, Art Chang is uh, uh, running for mayor of New York City. Chang is a technologist with multiple startups under his belt and a finance executive who co-founded the online voter engagement platform, NYC Votes. All right, are, ready, are we ready to uh, introduce Art Chang? Hello. 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 It's wonderful to be here. All right, so, All right, so I, I'm gonna go, I'm ahead, gonna go and ahead and read the, the first question. question. Is Edwin Stone available? I, I don't think he's joined. So the first question that we have is from Edwin Stone, who's a student at Hunter College. And Edwin asks, uh, based on uh, the NYPD Union's endorsement of Trump, whom a majority of the members of the LGBTQ community would not consider an ally, how are you going to protect the LGBTQ community from discrimination within the police force? Well, let me guess from the wording of the question that this is discrimination from within the police force or discrimination by the police force. And I think we have, we have both um, LGBTQ members of the police force, as well as um, uh, uh, I would say profiling and inequitable enforcement by the police of the LGBTQ plus community. And so I think I wanna make those, those points kind of very clear. So, you know, in, in my policy, um, there are really three major initiatives, right? The first one is that um, we need to restore the balance of powers, the checks and balances between the police department and the um, civilian leadership of the city of the city. So I'm calling for the um, removal of the sole disciplinary powers from the police chief. Um, I'm calling for the creation of an independent police accountability agency that would um, take in um, civilian complaints, investigate them and adjudicate them. Um, I'm also calling for, the second thing is to call for a demilitarization of police response to crisis, um, of shifting crisis to um, unarmed uh, rapid response teams that are comprised of violence interrupters, um, social workers and mental health professionals. And then the third is to reorient the entire focus of safety, not to equivalent that with policing, but to think about how we actually bring, create a healthier city, removing the stresses that lead to outbursts of violence and other unhealthy activity. Um, and so we need to be able to have that as our primary focus across the city. Excellent. Thank you so much for that response. Uh, now, the next question is from Elaine Al, who's also a student at Hunter College. Elaine would like to know what you would do to advocate for building safe shelter spaces for homeless members of the LGBTQ community. So how would you increase access to mental health and healthcare services in addition to increase access to health uh, to um, shelters? Thank you. Well, I'm going to focus first and foremost on on teens who are um, figuring out their gender identity. Uh, we have, a, a, yeah, as we know, um, before the before the pandemic, 40% of homeless teenagers were experiencing gender violence at home. And as a result, we need to think about having, creating supportive housing that puts them in, in, in context with their peers and run by very capable nonprofits like the Trevor Project. We need to expand those seats, expand the number of beds and to make that more widely available and to publicize it so people know that it exists. But we have to stop the causes for this. We can't have a city that is fair and equitable for everyone if we don't stem the causes of this gender-based violence against, against teens. We need to be able to educate families and especially immigrant families who come you know, with their own perspectives from you know, abroad. And, they can, and we need to actually educate everyone so that people understand the specific needs and the specific requirements of teens who are trying to figure this important phase of their life out. Because if we don't do that, and then we lead to increasing the cycles of poverty and despair, and it leads to a very unhealthy city. Excellent, thank you so much for that um, response. Um, let's, I'm gonna go ahead now and move to a couple of general questions. So first, um, what do you think is the most pressing issue facing the LGBTQ community in NYC? And how do you plan to address it as mayor? The most pressing um, issue is, is poverty. 
you know, as we know from, um, you know, civil, the, I believe it was a civil liberties report, um, the, the, the LGBTQ community across New York City is facing tremendous, you know, burdens of poverty, you know, and these, these cycles start, you know, at youth, you know, in, in, in the lack of acceptance by families, in the need to find a place that's safe, um, a lot of um, a disproportionate number of LGBTQ youth, um, you know, drop out of the educational system. It is hard to advance your, your life and career without education and without actually feeling safe. So, you know, I know what it's like not to be safe. I know what it's like to feel different. You know, I grew up um, in an all white community in Ohio where I faced racism on the street and domestic violence in my home. And that led to my becoming the second man to graduate with a women's studies degree from Yale. And um, what we need to do is to create a place where everyone feels safe, where everyone feels like they can pursue their future. And we can all be able to have a more prosperous city by taking care of everybody in our city from the bottom up. Excellent, thank you so much for that. I'm actually from Ohio as well. So I was really excited to hear you say that. Um, so let's go ahead, I have another uh, general question. Uh, and this one is, what was the first thing you did in support of LGBTQ rights? Oh, wow. Uh, 1981 um, was the um, first or second GLAD days at Yale. And I was the first and maybe only straight volunteer to help with the organization and putting on of that celebration. Oh, wow. Thank you so much for that. Um, let's go ahead and move on to a um, more specific question. So although NYC has made big strides towards including LGBTQ uh, individuals in city forms uh, and processes like adding a gender neutral option on birth certificates, the city has struggled to make forms and documents fully accessible. And this is especially true when it comes to pronouns. As a technologist who has experience <laughs> building online engagement platforms, what will you do to make city processes more accept, uh, accessible for LGBTQ people? Well, the first thing we have to do is we have to have a customer friendly city. It has to have an orientation where the people of the city, everybody who lives here are treated like valued customers of our government. And, you know, can you imagine any technology system commercially where once you select your pronouns, that it just wouldn't replicate across system to system. I mean, this is one very, very small way in which we need to be able to show respect for people and the choices they make. And we can need to address every person where they are, every community where they're at. And for folks who have, have you know, differences in language and other things, we should be able to automate the responses in the language they prefer, but again, maintaining their pronoun choices. Um, and I think, you know, when you look at, you know, places like, you know, healthcare and other government services, you know, in the absence of having a pronoun in, a, in an official document, we need to ask, have people ask a very simple question, which is what pronouns do you go by? Excellent. Um, the next question is um, on, uh, related to an, an, another issue that is also connected to the LGBTQ community. So recently, Manhattan District Attorney Cy Vance announced that his office would no longer prosecute prostitution. Many within the LGBTQ community argue that sex work is an LGBTQ issue for a number of reasons, including that trans women of color are often profiled and harassed as sex workers, regardless of whether or not they are. As mayor, would you support the decriminalization of sex work? Absolutely, 100%. I would eliminate the vice squad. Um, you know, I've worked closely with the district attorney to ensure that in the future, because we have an important district attorney election coming up, um, that this would re remain decriminalized. And then I work with the council and the state legislature to, to try to expand that into, into, into the law. Um, but it's a really important issue. I mean, I've seen this from moving into New York in 1985. You know, I've seen firsthand how, you know, trans people, trans women especially, are harassed and, and um, equated with sex workers when they're not. And, um, you know, this also ties in hand to hand with being able to create economic opportunity for people of all kinds in the city. 
that if you are trans, you should have the same opportunities as everybody else to complete your education, to find and make a way of living and to have life with dignity. You know, and that's really a kind of a key counterpoint to all of this. And there's way too much focus on, I think, the relationship between sex work and trans people. Great. Um, I see we're at the last minute. So what I, I would like you to do, because I don't, I think we have enough time for another question is, is there anything you would like uh, people watching the event to take away uh, with respect to your support for the LGBTQ community? The key to the, the, the city isn't really working for anyone. You know, we, it, and it has to work for everyone. You know, there's so, way too many people who don't feel like they belong here and, and everybody must feel like they belong. But to make this happen, you know, the problems have to be seen in their complexities that, uh, that they're as interconnected. And so the next mayor is gonna to have to be somebody who brings experience from the city and the state government and key nonprofits along with the mind from business, technology, finance, and the creativity of the arts. And, you know, we have to look at that. And I'm that candidate and that's why I'm running. Um, people can visit me on my website at chang.nyc and sign up for Zoom open office hours where they can meet me directly. Wonderful, thank you so much for joining us, Art Chang. Um, and good luck with the race. Great, thank you so much. It's a pleasure being here. All right. All right, so next uh, we have uh, Michelle Caruso Cabrera. Um, uh, Michelle uh, Caruso Cabrera is a candidate for comptroller and is a former financial an analyst and reporter uh, for CNBC. Carusa Cabrera is also a former producer at Univision News, where she won an Emmy Award for a series she produced about children orphaned during the AIDS crisis. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome uh, Michelle Carusa Cabrera. Hello. Um, so we're going to start with two questions from students. Uh, the first um, question is from Asia Sogo. Um, and Asia asks, uh, what will you do to ensure that LGBTQ New Yorkers can use their pronouns on local IDs and city forms rather than the sex they are assigned at birth? Is this something you will advocate for within the comptroller race if elected? So uh, thank you, Erin, for hosting this. It's a terrific event. I'm really appreciative of being here. You did highlight that I'm a journalist originally in my career. I have a biography that's going to be very different than almost anybody else who's running for citywide office. And the reason I'm telling you that, I, I want to answer this question, but first I want to point out that um, I was at CNBC for 21 years. Before that, I was at Univision, and I was the editor of my college paper and my high school paper. And going back to high school, I was very focused on, we didn't call them LGBTQ issues back then. Uh, I'm gonna date myself, Erin, uh, but when I was in college, I was censored, when I was in high school, I was censored twice when I was the editor of the paper. Uh, one time was when I wanted to, I did interview and I wrote up an interview that I did with um, a boy at my school uh, who came to school dressed in skirts and wore makeup. And at the time, uh, Boy George was brand new. This is how I'm dating myself. That's how old I am. Boy George was new. And, you know, a lot of parents thought he was scandalous. Um, and so I sat down with this, my classmate to say, hey, what, do you want to do an interview? Why is it that you come dressed to school wearing skirts and, and women's clothing? And we did, and he was, it was a lovely conversation. It was a great interview. I handed it in to be printed in the high school paper. And I was told that I could not that it would not run. Uh, there was another incident in my school related to um, a negative comments being said about uh, homosexual students. I tried to write that story as well, turned it in and I was censored. So I have been thinking about these issues and focused in, on them for decades now. I'm 52 years old, so it's been um, you know more than 30 years uh, that I've been thinking about these issues. Um, so people should be able to use the pronouns that they want to use. As controller, I will champion that um, what the controller does is, controller's in charge of auditing the city books and overseeing the pension funds. So to be able to direct what happens with websites, with the, with the controller's website, I will do everything I can to make sure that people can use the websites that they want. But my job is to also audit uh, the city's books. And one of the things we can do is a performance audit. To so what degree are all the city agencies being welcoming to uh, members of the LGBT community? And that is something that we can do across citywide to make sure that we are being as welcoming as possible to LGBTQ 
Q individuals. Excellent, thank you so much for that question. The next question we have is from another Hunter College student, uh, Michelle Gurevich. Michelle would like to know what you would do as controller to help LGBTQ New Yorkers pay for their basic needs, uh, given that New York City has one of the highest costs of living in the world. Sure does. Yes, um, what we can do for LGBTQ uh, folks and, and everyone else is we can provide more services that are needed. One of the things that I champion is we must have more affordable broadband access. We've got to close the digital divide. Too many of our young people don't have access to broadband because their families can't afford it. And the uh, companies and the corporations that provide broadband service don't do enough to make sure that their more affordable options are actually made available to people uh, and, and to families in need. That's got to be done across the entire spectrum of our entire population. Um, in addition, uh, to be more affordable, one of the things is making sure that CUNY goes back to being free. It used to be uh, the City University of New York. That would be something that would also help reduce costs for our most needy and our most vulnerable. Um, I, this issue is of particular importance to me because I am the only Latina in the race. I'm the only Spanish speaker in the race. And uh, nearly one third of our population in the city is Latino. And it's unfortunately um, a part of our population that doesn't have access to broadband as much as say wealthy families on the Upper East Side. So this divide has absolutely got to be closed. That's one of the ways that we can help um, people from all walks of life, including members of the LGBT community. Thank you so much for that answer. That is certainly something that we struggled, as, as an online educator, we struggled a I'll lot bet. with over the past year. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and move on to some general questions now. So the first question is, what do you think is the most pressing issue facing the LGBTQ community in New York City? And how do you plan to address it as comptroller? So um, there's a high level of, of homelessness amongst LGBTQ uh, teens. Uh, and I'm very concerned about that. They're incredibly vulnerable, both because of their age um, and because uh, of, of their situation. And so one of the things that really needs to be done is to improve the situation with our homeless shelters here in New York City and doing more to help the homeless. Um, we've had terrible scandals about the way we've spent money in New York City on homeless shelters that have failed our, our, our homeless uh, people and what's uh, their intentions and what's supposed to be happening. I don't know if you know or are aware of the scandal that occurred with a, a Bronx a homeless shelter provider uh, that had a Me Too scandal and also uh, was providing shoddy care. So the role of the controller is to follow the money. That's something that I've done for 20 years when I was at CNBC, uh, income statements, balance sheets, and cash flows. And so how does that play out here? That means making sure we do a much better job of overseeing the money that's spent on the homelessness issue to make sure it's actually producing the outcomes that we want and that we need and not being wasted because money that's wasted actually leads to um, lives that could be lost, for example, if we're spending it poorly when it comes to healthcare and lives that suffer if we don't provide enough quality housing for people. So every single thing the Comptroller can do is very much related to auditing, either performance audits, forensic audits, or traditional audits, and making sure that we are getting the outcomes that we want for the money that we are spending. You know, the budget's gone up by $20 billion since Bill de Blasio came into office seven years ago. And you talk to anybody in New York and ask them, does the city feel $20 billion a year better to you? Do you feel like the services you're getting better? Is the subway better? Are the roads better? Is your access to healthcare better? Are jobs better? It's not, we've got to do a much better job. It's not about, you'll, you'll hear people talking about cutting the budget because we have a financial crisis. No, it's about making sure that what we spend, we spend it better because we're not getting what we deserve from that money. And that helps everyone, including members of the LGBT community. Thank you so much for that. Let's actually, um, I'm gonna ask you specifically about the budget now. Sure. So at New York City is expecting by some estimates to have a 5.25 billion budget gap in the upcoming fiscal year, which the comptroller is expected to create, a, create budget solutions to address. Yeah. And as comptroller, what will you do to ensure that services are not cut for LGBTQ people? Yeah. And what services would you advocate to expand? 
So we, we've gotten very lucky that the federal government has provided New York State and New York City with billions of dollars that actually gives us some breathing room for the next two years. So next year's budget in New York is going to be $98 billion, even bigger than this year's budget. And that's, you know, because we won Georgia, so we control um, the Congress. And so that's why New York City could have um, that kind of money come in, because if we hadn't won Georgia, excuse me, if Democrats had not won Georgia, then it's possible we couldn't have gotten that money for New York. And it's extremely important that we did because that means that we don't have to cut services so drastically as had been feared. Um, but you're right, two years from now, we are gonna face issues. Um, we cannot deny money to our most needy, our most vulnerable in the city. So I will be a champion uh, to making sure that money that is allocated is actually achieving the outcomes that we want, including protecting members of the LGBT community. Excellent. Um, with our next question, I'd like to go on to um, a question about employment uh, discrimination. Uh, so according to a recent survey from the Trevor Project, 35% of LGBTQ youth experience employment discrimination, and for trans people, that number jumps to 61%. As controller, what would you do to combat employment uh, discrimination and promote wage equality for LGBTQ youth? So, so um, first, even within our own house, when you're when I'm controller, I will be certain to make sure that we do not have discrimination against members of the LGBTQ community. Um, we should be a welcoming. We should be a leader and a role model to the rest of the city. Uh, and I will help the city council and the mayor uh, champion laws that prevent that kind of discrimination because it's not just, and it shouldn't be occurring. And I'm gonna stop because I see that there's only 30 se seconds left, I'm sorry. <laughs> Do you have any final um, uh, thoughts you'd like to uh, say to uh, the audience? Sure, yeah. Um, so like I've said, my bio is very different than anybody else in this race. I've been a journalist, a financial uh, investigative journalist. I've followed the money. I've covered financial crises and what I've seen all over the world is those who can least afford to pay always end up paying the most. And I'm running because I don't want that to happen here. I'm also someone with 30 years of real life experience, I'm not a sitting elected official, I'm not a career politician, I don't owe anyone anything. And that independence is gonna be really important in the next, uh, when we get our next round of money here in the city. And I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you all. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, it was a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you, Erin. All right, so let's go ahead and move on to the next candidate who is uh, Zachary Iskol. Uh, Zachary Iskol is, a, is also a candidate for controller. Iskol is a former Marine and an Iraq war veteran who is a nonprofit leader and entrepreneur. And he is the founder of the Headstrong Project, which provides top quality free mental health care. Um, so we'll begin uh, with a, a question from uh, Erta Nazar, hi. Erta, are you, are you ready to ask your question? Yes, hi. Hey, Erta, how are you? Good, how are you? Good, thanks for having me here today. Um, so my question is, how can the government develop a program to secure the LGBTQ plus community health and safety if they're not welcomed by their family when coming out and are then faced with homelessness? How can we effectively use government resources to help young LGBTQ plus adults who are homeless or at risk of experiencing homelessness? Yeah, uh, thank you for this question. Um, so I think one is it's really about radically, it's a number of things. Um, and your question touches a couple different points. Um, one is about mental health. Uh, another part of it is about safety and shelter um, and about providing people a sense of belonging. Uh, there's a lot of models that can be used. Um, I think some of it is also just about improving some of the existing models, making sure that the city's uh, shelter system uh, is, um, and especially some of the um, LGD, LGBTQIA shelters for youth are safe, are clean, are welcoming, um, that we provide uh, community programming for youth that are fleeing their homes. Um, and that they are able to have a sense of, of belonging and purpose and that there is a safe place that is also welcoming that for them to go. And I think there's a lot of work that the city of New York can do to lead the way on that uh, and to improve a lot of some of these existing systems. Uh, the other thing is about mental health. Um, so as Aaron said, I 
started my public service in the Marine Corps. I built businesses, nonprofits. I'm very proud. I've never left anyone behind. And about nine, 10 years ago, I started to lose more of my Marines to suicide than I did in combat. And so I built an organization called the Headstrong Project that's now one of the leading largest providers of mental health care in the U.S. And when we started, we were focused on combat PTSD. Uh, pretty soon, uh, we started treating military sexual trauma. Uh, a big component, um, a lot of people that we ended up treating were people who had been gay, trans, um, lesbian uh, in the military, just the trauma of that. And so we slowly expand our service. And I'm very, very proud that Cornell University a few months ago adopted our program to expand, to use our treatment methodology to launch a program specifically for LGBTQIA uh, youth at Cornell uh, here in New York City. And that's another sort of a component of this is leveraging public-private partnerships to provide the world-class cost bureaucracy-free treatment uh, that our gay and trans youth need um, to recover from their trauma. Thank you so much for that um, response. Um, I, uh, the next question I have had for you was actually going to be about uh, mental health, but, so I'm going to pivot to another student I'm happy question. to stand mental health. I <laughs> am all about mental health. So you're, you're all, I think you're all ready. we can talk about mental health, it's, it's one of the biggest issues facing the city. It is the other pandemic we're not talking about. I'm happy to talk more about it. All right, well, why, why don't we go ahead and I'll ask the question so you can um, uh, go ahead and address that. So this is from Ismerlin Gonzalez, Gonzalez, who was a student at Hunter College. And Ismerlin asks, how would you ensure that LGBTQ youth receive adequate uh, access to mental health counseling and other resources since uh, many had to quarantine with unsupported family members during the pandemic? So it's a slightly different way at getting at the mental health question than the previous one. Yeah. So I had a, a Marine in Fallujah uh, named Brandon Burns who was shot in the head. He survived. And I struggled to get him into the VA. Uh, he, we could get him into the VA to treat uh, for his physical wounds, but not for his emotional wounds. They wouldn't accept that his emotional wounds were service related. Imagine that. And so we built a program, the Headstrong Project, that is now in 30 cities, caring for 800 to 1,000 veterans every single week. Um, and it provides world-class treatment that is cost-free, bureaucracy-free, completely confidential, and most importantly, effective. Uh, we do it at $5,000 per patient over six months uh, to treat trauma. Uh, trauma compounds itself over time. Uh, so really the amount of trauma you're treating can vary, but on average, it takes about six months to cure somebody of PTSD. There's a lot of other mental health issues that are much more difficult to treat. Um, but the reason I say that is there's a report that came out in the city, a uh, publication in New York a couple of weeks ago, Thrive NYC, good effort, uh, a, a, a program of good intentions, but poorly executed, $1.1 million per visit. So what will I do? Um, I will make sure we are investing those dollars in a way that we are actually providing care that is effective to people. And Excellent. I know how to do that. 85 cents of every dollar for Headstrong goes directly to care. We haven't lost a single veteran to suicide in almost a decade. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much for that response. Mental health is uh, certainly a, a massive issue within the LGBTQ community. Uh, I'm going to now move on to just a, a general question. Um, what uh, do you uh, think is the most pressing issue facing the LGBTQ community and NYC? And what would you, uh, how would you plan to address it as comptroller? I don't want to sound like a broken record, but mental health. Um, and, you know, the way I'll address that is by making sure that those services are available, that they're effective. There's so much that we could be doing in terms of both reducing the need for mental health through access to the outdoors, healthy diets, creating community. Um, in addition to scaling new technologies uh, for things like um, uh, enabling more culturally um, uh, competent clinicians through telemedicine uh, to scale the treatment that people need but also making sure that people have the training. You know, a lot of, when I was in high school, we got our first aid certification. I'm sure a lot of you young people still get it. We need a mental health care certification so that people are able to identify when a friend is in need, how to help them, at least initially, how to get them the right help they need before something comes to a moment of crisis. So across the spectrum, there is so much we could be in the, doing in the city and we have the resources to do here. And I've done that in my career. Excellent, thank you so much for that response. Uh, my next question is, um, uh, what was the first thing you did in support of LGBTQ rights? Oh, God. So I have a lot of family members who are gay. 
And so it might've been when one of them was coming out. I think actually probably the thing that, um, 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 sorry, we have three rescue dogs and uh, my wife is coming home and they're very excited. Uh, I walked in on a, um, on a friend making out with another service member. Uh, and this was um, during the time of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Um, and I was an ally. Um, and I was a resource for that service member. Um, I didn't tell. Um, but I think that was probably the first thing. I've also been a strong advocate throughout my entire career. I was a huge uh, advocate for ending Don't Ask, Don't Tell. I didn't think at the time when it ended that it went far enough. It never extended survivor benefits to gay spouses. Um, I've been a huge advocate for trans rights, um, especially within the military and veterans community. Um, but I think when I think back to like, what was the first moment that was probably, that was probably it, putting my career on the line at that moment. Right. Um, and I, I will ask you this question as well. So thousands of people flee homophobic and transphobic persecution in their home countries and expect to find safety in the United States, yet many face hardships once they arrive. And many of these people end up in NYC. As controller, how would you make city services more accessible to LGBTQ immigrants? Yeah, um, thank you for this question. And I think it's important, you know, New York City matters, right? It's a place of inspiration. It's a place of refuge and you hit the nail on the head, but it's not just it's a place of refuge for people fleeing oppression abroad. It's also a place of refuge for people who are fleeing oppression back home. And often that's LGBT youth who are fleeing their homes around the country and coming to New York for a better life. Um, I think a huge part of this is, um, and this is something that faces a lot of immigrant communities, is making sure that there are not just cultural um, services available, um, that you sort of reduce the cultural barriers to people accessing uh, services, but also the language barriers and making sure that when a refugee, like my own Iraqi family, I had a, a Iraqi translator who I my life to, who I was able to bring over to the United States, very long story, um, ended up testifying for the United States. But when he came here, there's a number of immigrant, there's a number of immigration services, uh, uh, International Refuge, uh, Refugee Committee is one of them, uh, HRC is another one, um, but making sure that those organizations um, are helping people um, who are LGBTQ access the services that they need and that they have the training and the resources to make sure that they are getting what they need to uh, uh, settle here in New York City. Excellent, thank you so much for that uh, answer. Um, the next question I'd like to ask you is, uh, actually, let's, we're, we're at the last minute. So um, what I'd like to do is just give you the, the opportunity to just say some final words uh, a takeaway um, for everyone on LGBTQ issues uh, in the audience. Yeah. So first off, thank you all for having me here. Thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to present to you all. Um, I'm somebody who I'm very proud of in my, my career. I've never left somebody behind, whether it was in or out of combat. When I began to lose more Marines to suicide than I did in combat, I built the Headstrong Project. When, I, when we abandoned our translators overseas, I testified before the United States Senate to create a pathway for them to come here. Almost 100,000 Iraqis and Afghan and their Afghan translators and their families have used that pathway. Um, the height of COVID, I went to Javits Medical Center as a volunteer, uh, served as the deputy director there to make sure New Yorkers got care during COVID. I've never left anyone behind. I will make sure this city uses every resource possible to take care of all New Yorkers, especially our LGBTQIA youth, who are also such a vital, vital part and fabric of our city. So thank you for having me here today. And uh, I'll put my phone number in the, in the chat, also my email if anybody has any other questions or needs to get a hold of me. Thank you. Excellent, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and move on to the next candidate. Uh, next, we're going to speak with Brad Lander. Uh, Brad Lander is a, camp, a candidate for controller and also a city council member who represents the 39th district, which includes the Brooklyn neighborhoods, Carroll Gardens, Park Slope and Kensington. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and begin uh, with a question from a student at Hunter College uh, from Vanessa Fuentes. Vanessa, are you ready to ask your question? Hi, yes, I am. Hi, right, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so New York City, the New York City shelter system is allegedly considered um, 
consistently recognized as the most sophisticated and comprehensive in the nation, according to their website. Yet many LGBTQI individuals experience physical and verbal abuse once they are in it. If you become controller, what if anything would you do differently to ensure not only the right to shelter, as is now the case, but also that the dignity and respect of every individual, including those who are LGBTQ, is upheld? Thank you very much for that question, Vanessa and Aaron. Thank you for the invitation. It's really an honor to be with all of you. My name is Brad Lander. My pronouns are he, him. I'm a New York City Council member running to be the next New York City controller. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to be with you. I want to wish everyone a happy uh, Pride Month. Um, you know, there's a lot to celebrate and a lot more work to do. And your question really gets at that. The fact that LGBTQ people, especially, but not only young people in our shelter system are fearing for their safety uh, and for their lives. They're, you know, you're afraid on the street for your safety, but you're afraid to go into the shelter system for who you are facing identity-based hate violence. You know, that's what it is and we must do better. So um, I've been uh, proud to be pushing in the council for the last decade to increase the number of runaway homeless youth shelters that are a dedicated place for young people, many of whom are coming to New York City because when they came out to families, they faced, um, you know, they, they wound up having to leave. And then I've also been an advocate for establishing more shelters that are specifically for LGBTQ uh, New Yorkers. That's not the only answer, right? We have to make our shelters safe for everyone. And of course, what we really want is safe, affordable, permanent housing. Um, but in the meantime, while we are meeting that right to shelter, we absolutely must do it in a way that is safe for people. So um, this is one of the things, you know, the controller uh, audits every city agency at least once every four years. And when we go and look at both the Department of Homeless Services and the Department of Youth and Community Development, which is where those runaway homeless youth uh, shelters and services are provided, this will be one of the issues I've looked at. I'm the only candidate that's put out a proposal specifically for how to use the tools of the office to support LGBTQ communities. And at the center of that is this idea of doing equity audits. So you look in on a particular agency, a particular service or function with an equity lens and looking at our shelters with the LGBTQ lens to guarantee safety for people is one of the first places that I would start. Excellent, thank you so much for that answer. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and move on to another student question. This is from uh, Jasmine He. Uh, Jasmine asks, how would you address the problem of sexual harassment of LGBTQ individuals in the workplace? Mm. Uh, thank you for this question. So uh, critical, Jasmine. Um, you know, obviously we have had through the Me Too movement um, a moment of, of reckoning and demanding that people not face sexual harassment and be silent about it, but will be supported. Um, but we have to lean in and make that work even better. Um, one of the things that I think the controller can do to help is the controller is the fiduciary for the city's five pension funds, which represent $250 billion under management invested in companies all throughout the economy. Um, and uh, a really useful thing to do is shareholder activism, teaming up with other investors uh, to ask a whole range of equity questions um, about pay equity uh, for women, for people of color, for LGBTQ folks uh, on, in the boardroom, but also in sexual harassment policies. So I would be glad to team up with you, with activists and with other shareholders um, to demand that companies that where the city's investing in through our pension funds have strong sexual harassment policies and really show up for their LGBTQ employees. Um, that's good business. So it makes sense from a pension fund point of view to say, if we're going to invest in your company, we want you to do well, but you've got to be treating all your people fairly. And if there's sexual harassment of, of women, of LGBTQ staff, uh, we expect you to show up for it. And then of course, in city agencies, this is a critical function for auditing, as I mentioned before, to demand real full protection. Um, and I'll just say that all starts and I'll start this if I, if I have the good fortune to win even before I get to the office in auditing the policies of the controller's office itself, uh, because you can't go out and do audits of anybody else on these critical equity and sexual harassment issues. If your audit isn't top rate, I'm proud to be the only candidate uh, running in New York City with a unionized campaign. Uh, there's a no tolerance for sexual harassment policy as part of our union of the union contract, the staff negotiated with me. Um, and I'll bring that same spirit to the controller's office. 
Excellent. Thank you so much for both of those responses. Uh, let's go ahead. I'm going to move on to a couple of general questions. Uh, so first, um, what do you think is the most pressing issue facing the LGBTQ community in New York City? And how do you plan to address it as comptroller? Absolutely. I mean, I think there's obviously multiple LGBTQ communities. So I think it's a little hard to generalize here. You have, you know, immigrants coming and dealing with a whole set of issues. Um, you have, you know, we're about now, I think June 6th is the one year anniversary of the day Leilene Polanco uh, died in the Department of Corrections custody after being incarcerated for $500 bail for a low level prostitution charge. And, you know, we know that especially black trans women are more likely to be assaulted by the NYPD, to be targeted by the NYPD vice squad, to be homeless. So, um, I guess I would start there. I mean, there's critical work to do across the board and communities face so many different challenges. I've been working with Girls for Gender Equity on a, a LGBTQ and gender equity friendly dress code in the New York City schools. But if I have to pick one thing, I guess it would be uh, showing up for black transgender women um, around policing, around uh, homelessness, around safety. Uh, because we know, you know, that one in six transgender people has been uh, subject to, to violence. That's just a place where I really think it's critical for us to focus as a city. Thank you so much for that. Since you, since you mentioned policing and violence, I'd like to ask you a little bit more about that. Uh, so according to a 2013 report from the Anti-Violence Project, transgender people are three point times more likely to experience police violence and seven times more likely to experience physical violence when interacting with the police. As controller, what would you do to reform policing in New York City? Yeah, um, I wanna um, start by saying that I believe in doing this work in partnership with the organizations who are organizing and representing people. So you mentioned the Anti-Violence Project and I'm proud to be working with them. Um, you know, with Audre Lorde, uh, with the Ali Fournay Center, with the Halt Solitary campaign, with the Decrim NY campaign. Um, the controller's got a set of tools that have to be used uh, independently and your, your audits have to live up to government standards. But that doesn't mean you don't work with the community groups, with folks who are closest to the problems and work with them on what needs to change. Um, you know, one thing in particular on the NYPD is that I think it's time to end the vice squad. The vice squad is mostly just a place, as I see it, for targeting, especially transgender folks, targeting women of color um, without, to me, an appreciable benefit for public safety. Um, you know, I voted, uh, well, uh, I teamed up uh, in the city council in my second term with council member, then council member, now public advocate Jumani Williams to pass the Community Safety Act to end discriminatory stop and frisk and create the office of the NYPD Inspector General. Last year, I voted no on the city's budget because we did not rise to the opportunity and the challenge of transforming policing so that instead of sending police to deal with uh, folks who are in mental health crisis or assistant, you know, intimate partner violence, helping people escape, or just in our schools, having guidance counselors instead of cops, um, so I think there's a whole range of ways working with communities that we can invest in the forms of community safety and the resources that will keep people safe. Um, and I'll do that together as a partner with LGBTQ community organizations as I have all my time in the council. Excellent, thank you so much for that. I, I next like to ask you a question I've been asking all the other candidates. Um, so what was the first thing you did in support of LGBTQ rights? Um, I'm not 100% sure this is the first, but it's the one that I remember from the longest ago. Um, uh, we got married, Meg and I got married in 1996, and it happened right at that time that the Defense of Marriage Act, this appalling act, was being moved through Congress and was headed to the president's desk, just a blatantly discriminatory uh, act long before uh, marriage equality was, was, pow was on the table. And at our wedding, uh, we, had a, we turned it basically into an advocacy campaign. We handed out to all the guests uh, uh, an information and advocacy sheet, and we called the White House to say, don't you dare sign the Defense of Marriage Act. And unfortunately, President Clinton did. So it wasn't like our wedding advocacy was successful. Um, but it was building power together um, with, you know, so many LGBTQ friends and people that were there to demand real equality and justice. Well, thank you so much for that answer. Just with the remaining time that we have, um, is there anything you'd like the audience to take away uh, from your candidacy with respect to LGBTQ issues? 
Thank you so much for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm running the bold progressive campaign for New York City Comptroller. I'm proud to have the support of Senator Elizabeth Warren, AOC, Jumani Williams, so many LGBTQ leaders. I'm proud to be supported by Stonewall Democrats and Lambda Independent Democrats, Cynthia Nixon, Tiffany Caban, Crystal Hudson, and over three dozen LGBTQ leaders. That's in part because I'm the only candidate in the race who's put forward a specific platform for how to use the tools of the controller's office to support LGBTQ communities, to center trans women of color, and really to advance gender equity and justice with all the tools of the office. I'll drop those plans in the chat afterwards, and I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you. Thank you so much for dropping in. All right, so let's go ahead and move on to our next candidate. Our, our next candidate is uh, Fernando Mateo. Fernando Mateo is a candidate for mayor, an entrepreneur, and the president of the New York State Federation of Taxi Drivers. Mateo was awarded the Points of Light Award by George H.W. Bush in 1991, and he also founded the Toys for Guns program at Christmas time in 1993, an exchange program that was eventually rolled out nationwide and helped get guns out of the hands of criminals. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and begin with two questions from students. Our first question comes from Ariana Ahmed. Ariana, are you ready to ask your question? Yes, I am. Hello, Mr. Mateo. Um, one of the first questions that I would like to ask you is that in an era of vocal promises, how do you plan to ensure that LGBTQ New Yorkers are receiving the physical support that they deserve? And this support goes from anywhere from affordable housing to legal counseling and even shelter when they're being domestically abused or they're out on the street. I urge you to be as uh, detailed as you possibly can with your policies and any other prospective ideas that you have. You're muted. Listen, thanks for the question. I, I can only answer them honestly because I don't, I'm not a politician. And, I don't, and I'm, I don't like politics and I'm not a politician. I'm running for mayor because the, the city needs a lot, lot of help in a lot of different areas. This is an area that I am quite unfamiliar with, but I will have the experts, the best people that I can reach to make sure that they give me the advices that we need. If I, if I were to sit here and tell you that I have a detailed policy for your question, I would be lying to you. So the only real answer that I can give you is an honest one. And that is understanding the issues better making sure that every human being, regardless of what, what nature, what, what uh, uh, gender they want to have or not have, whether you're gay, whether you're not, it, to me, we're all human beings. We're all sons of God. We're all people that need to live and have a better city. So whatever services are needed to make sure that any community that's in trouble, I will make sure that I have the right people in place to make sure that we address those issues. Excellent, thank you so much for that answer. Um, I'm gonna go ahead now and move on to a question from another student um, from Elizabeth Guevara. Uh, Elizabeth asks, uh, many homeless individuals that are part of the LGBTQ community uh, prefer to sleep in the streets uh, than go to one of the 450 shelters across New York City uh, because often their lives are in danger and they are likely to be sexually assaulted. Uh, therefore, what actions would you implement uh, that will make shelters safer for members of the LGBTQ community? It, it is very sad that the city doesn't, doesn't have a leader that can make the shelter safe or, or basically change the nature of these shelters. What I would do as a strong leader in this city is I would privatize every homeless shelter in New York City. I would privatize it because government has no idea what to do about the homeless situation in New York. This isn't something new. It's not something that appeared because of COVID. We've been having this issue since the end of the Bloomberg era. It was getting better. And then it just got totally worse. Why did it get worse? Because we have it in the hands of government. I would make sure that we put out re a request for proposals from private sector industries that can come in, take over the homeless shelters that currently exists, while we build homeless shelters for others. I look at the problems with the LG, LBGT community as a situation very similar to people that bully others. Sometimes you go to public school and because you're smart and you're, you're weak and you're just into studying, 
You get bullied by others. Why? Because they feel they have an advantage over you. I believe that anyone that is not uh, uh, straight in one way or another is always bullied. They're picked on because they looked upon as being weak. And that's something that I will not tolerate. My administration will make sure that we give equal opportunity, equal housing to everyone, regardless of, of who they are or where they come from. If we see that we have a certain section of our population, like the LGBTQ community, I would make sure that we have special housing for them so that they feel safe, so that they don't have to sleep in the street. No one, especially people that feel that they're being picked on should be living in the streets of New York City. It's not right, it's not fair. But then again, local politicians and elected officials will paint you rosy stories of the policies that they have and all of the things and all of the changes that they're gonna make. And when they, be, when they come into office, they do absolutely nothing. I have a plan. We have so many areas in New York City that are called industrial parks. These industrial parks are inhabited. You can build really good housing there for the billions of dollars that we're spending in these hotels and these homeless shelters. And we could build real housing and create real living conditions for people that need the help. But I would make sure that no one is bullied in our, um, in our shelter system because it will be privatized and people will be held accountable. Right now, there's no accountability for that. Thank you so much for that answer and especially for emphasizing bullying. Um, what I would like uh, to now do is just ask a couple of general questions. Uh, so the first question is, uh, what do you think is the most pressing issue facing the LGBTQ community in NYC and how do you plan to address it as mayor? I think bullying, I think assaults, I think crime in general affects the LGBTQ community more than any other community. Because people want to take advantage. They, they feel that they, that, they can, that they can abuse them because they're, they're, they see them as not being uh, equal to them. So they abuse their power against them. And that is wrong. You know, the, the gay community, as far as I see it, is a community that needs support, is a community that needs protection. Just like the Asians are being attacked, just like the Jews were being attacked. The, LGBTQ community has been under attack for years, for decades. And we haven't really done anything aggressive enough to stop it. You know, we, would, we have a, an, a, an incredible police department. And we know that a lot of the NYPD officers, whether they're male or female, belong to the LGBTQ community. You know what, we need to bring them on board. They understand and they know better what is needed for their community. And we would set up um, uh, task forces like we do, like I was able to do for the taxi industry, for the bodega industry, for the uh, for inmates at Rikers Island. You set up basically, you set up teams that are gonna basically be looking out and focusing on the issues that are happening on real time in the LGBTQ community. We shouldn't wait for someone to get killed or murder to then be proactive. We should be proactive every day, not when things happen and it's all over the news. I mean, it's, we need to punish those that abuse or assault or rob anyone in the LGBTQ community. And we need for the district attorneys to do their job. And we need for judges to come down with harsh sentences. It's the only way we're gonna send a message and a signal that you know what? We're not gonna tolerate this kind of abuse in any community that is vulnerable. Thank you so much for that response. Uh, the next question I'd like to ask is one I've been asking of all the candidates. Uh, what was the first thing you did in support of LGBTQ rights? Basically, I support them in whichever way I possibly can. Being in business and not being in politics, I haven't engaged that much, but whenever I've had anyone from the LGBTQ community come to me for help, for assistance, for anything that was done to them that they feel no one's doing anything about, I get involved. How do I get involved? By being vocal about it, by letting them know that, hey, 
you can always count on me. You know, you can lean on me, you can count on me. And that's the kind of person that I am. I've done maybe not as much as elected officials because that's their job. I'm not in office. I've never been in office. I've never occupied a public office. That's why I'm coming into this with, a, with, with different ideas, with different solutions, because I'm not going to speak to you about policies. I'm not a policy guy. I'm a position guy. I'm a guy that will take a position and he will execute it. I will execute it, but I will not give you policies that, you know what, it, policies are forgotten and you know that better than anyone. Thank you so much for that response. Uh, the next question I'd like to ask you is about um, the Republican um, race in particular. So recently the Republican party has struggled to reach out to the LGBTQ community. The national platform, for example, denies uh, many basic rights such as the right to marry. As a Republican, why should members of the LGBTQ community vote for you as mayor? Well, once again, I am an urban Republican. I am not your right wing Republican that, you know, is like the left wing Democrats. I'm in the middle. I am in New York City. I will be the next mayor of New York City and I will address the issues that affect our city. And because we will address them here and correct them here, it will be a ripple effect across the country. The mayor of New York has a huge pulpit and you've got to be able to use it to denounce what's right and what's wrong. Personal beliefs, you know, everyone's got a personal belief. Everyone believes different things. I know what I believe. I know what's in my heart. And I know how I would be when dealing with the LGBTQ community. It's not a community that should be discriminated against. It's a community that we need to uplift. We need to help. We need to strengthen. We need to let them know that we got their back. And that's what I will do. I will have their back. Thank you so much for joining us today. It was a pleasure to have the opportunity to speak with you. And uh, thank you for answering our student questions, especially. Thank you. It was an honor being here and I will serve you and I will protect you as mayor of New York City. Believe me. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Now I'm going to move on to our, our next candidate. Our next candidate is Alex Pan. Alex is a candidate for controller and a college student at Denison University. As the youngest candidate to make the uh, ballot in NYC history, Alex hopes to bring the voice of Generation Z uh, to the city government. All right, Alex, we're going to begin uh, with a question from Ariana Ahmed again. Ariana, are you ready to ask your question? Mm -hmm. Hello, Alex. So I will be asking you kind of the same question that in an era of vocal promises, how do you plan to ensure that LGBTQ New Yorkers are getting the resources that they need and especially physical support, whether it be affordable housing, healthcare, and legal counseling. And of course, I urge you to be as detailed as you possibly can. And I, yeah. Um, Ariana, um, thank you. I got the first half of your question and the second half got sort of cut off on um, the audio. I can repeat it, is that, um, if you want to. Yes, definitely. So, I basically asked that, how do you plan to ensure that New Yorkers are receiving the physical help that they need, which I see it as affordable housing and shelter, emergency shelter, and also legal counseling, especially for LGBTQ New Yorkers? Mm -hmm. um, those are some really important points. Um, I think to start off um, in terms of affordable housing um, and units like that. So on our policy platforms, um, we are looking at using the controller's economically targeted investments and putting in money to build more housing. But also um, it's come to my attention quite literally, I came off a phone call yesterday um, with a, I believe a tenant organizer um, or a nitro whistleblower um, about how there are actually a ton of units available but they're currently not using them um, for some sort of reason and they're using that to um, back up prices in other areas or use that as an excuse to build more units. Um, so I think using the auditing powers of the controller to look into the situation um, because of course it just got brought up to my attention um, going on the ground and grassroots the other day. Um, but looking at how we can be building more um, or looking at how we can get it into the hands of people who need it the most. Also looking at how we ensure that these um, areas are safe. You know, I think that 
in the whole intersectionality part um, of this, it's important to look at how housing and how all of these different factors um, weigh in together to be creating a stronger community. Um, I hope that answers part of it. Um, what was the second part again, Ariana? I'm sorry for asking again. So as a policy major, I'm really um, I'm curious about how legal counseling would be offered to LGBTQ New Yorkers that are facing domestic abuse, violence at home. So if, are there any physical structures that you think could be put in place for legal counseling at a low, reduced, or even free cost? Mm -hmm. um, so that part is incredibly important in terms of legal representation and funding that. So right now there are actually races going on for the Manhattan District Attorney and other races, um, and they're tackling issues like this. And what my job as controller would be um, to do is I would be rooting out waste in our government. I'd be looking at spending currently um, and spending levels and making sure that if we can cut inefficiencies, um, can we reinvest that into um, more legal aid programs, into additional grant funding for our legal aid societies? Um, and if there are um, particular programs that need to be created, um, how do we make sure that we are getting them into the communities that need them the most? So I would be looking at cutting waste and putting that funding that we root out um, and reinvesting that back into making sure that legal representation is available. Thank you so much for that response, Alex. I next have another question from a student and this is um, from Jasmine He. Uh, Jasmine asks, how would you address the problem of sexual harassment of LGBTQ plus individuals in the workplace? Um, thank you so much, Jasmine. That's also another really important question, looking at um, sexual harassment and abuse in the workplace. So the controller's auditing powers also includes looking at the data from all different departments around the city. And the controller, I believe, is every four years during the term required to audit um, our city agencies. So what I would be doing if I were to be lucky enough to be elected would be looking at all of this data with my teams and making sure that we are complying with FOIA requests or freedom of information law requests and looking at getting back to individuals who file complaints, making sure that they are being dealt with in equitable time allotments and we are getting them resolved. We would also be looking at, um, because looking first within the controller's department, the controller's department has 600 employees. Uh, we have to make sure that we are doing a good job in terms of this first before we look out to other city agencies and departments. So I would also be looking internally within the department and seeing how we could improve our internal processes and investigation processes in terms of sexual harassment um, and sexual um, abuse cases. Um, also looking at how the controller is the chief fiduciary of our city's pension funds. We have an enormous amount of investor power um, and we have an, uh, sort of activist investors um, and shareholders that can go onto the boards of companies and make sure that within major companies that we hold stakes in, these policies are being reflected um, in their own companies. So we may not, let's say, have access to a major bank um, directly, but we have the power to say, we wanna appoint somebody to the board or we want them to try and gain a seat on the board um, who reflect these values. And that's exactly what I would be doing if I were a controller. Thank you so much uh, for bringing that up, especially with the pensions. Um, next, I'm going to ask you two general questions that I've been asking uh, all the candidates. So the first is, what do you think is the most pressing issue facing the LGBTQ community in New York City? And how would you plan to address it as controller? So the most pressing issue, I think, that's facing the LGBTQ plus community right now is um, in the education sector. Um, so looking at how we have LGBTQ plus um, inclusive cur uh, curriculum in the Common Core um, and looking at how we are having education that is reflective of that so that future generations um, that come through our school systems, they understand how um, sort of sometimes one-sided history or history lessons that don't necessarily reflect all of it, um, it's in there. 
so that's that's a huge part um, of what I think is the most pressing priority for um, LGBTQ plus issues. Um, also, I, I think I mentioned it a tiny bit before. It's really slightly, um, but sort of the inter intersectionality of it. Um, because I was trying, I was trying to do my research um, beforehand with my team before coming to this event with you, and I was looking at um, particularly Equality New York's um, sort of five pillars um, and sort of their pie charts on how this connects to um, sort of policing and this connects to sex work and this connects to all sorts of different moving parts and making sure that we address that is going to be incredibly important for us moving forward. Excellent, thank you so much for that. Uh, my next question is, um, what is uh, the first thing you did in support of LGBTQ rights? Hmm. I'm gonna give that a quick second. Um, I think the first thing that comes um, off of the top of my head, uh, <laughs> I mean, I think it was, I was going to get sushi with my best friend and um, he told me he was um, bisexual and I was like, okay, that, that's, that's really good. Um, you know, you, you, he came out the closet at that moment um, for the first time to me and I just didn't know what to do. Um, and I think being there for him and supporting him through it, um, because I think within a lot of the um, groups and the friend groups I had at the time, there was a lot of internalized homophobia um, and things of that um, nature. And it was really difficult navigating that with him. And for the most part, he just needed somebody to support him. And I, I tried to be there. Um, and I remember that being a really difficult moment um, for him. So I, I think that's that's my first, um, but yeah. Thank you so much for that response. I'd now like to turn return to something you said in one of your prior responses where you talked about sex work. Um, and uh, recently the Manhattan District Attorney announced that his office would no longer prosecute prostitution. Uh, and many within the LGBTQ community argue that sex work is an LGBTQ issue for a number of reasons, including that trans women of color are often profiled and harassed as sex workers, regardless of whether or not they are. As controller, would you support the decriminalization of sex work in New York City? 100%, I would support the decriminalization of sex work. Um, I think that we should get rid of the, um, I believe the vice squad of the NYPD. Um, we should be looking at 100% dealing with this. Thank you so much for that response. In our remaining time, uh, would you like, is there anything you'd like to say as a takeaway, as a final thought uh, to the LGBTQ community and the audience? I think um, for a lot of it, um, my, my campaign hasn't specifically put out a platform um, addressing LGBTQ plus issues. And we are working on that um, in the coming days. So I think conversations like these are incredibly important for myself and for my campaign as we move forward, as the primaries are nearing um, and making sure that we are getting everything down. So um, thank you so much for inviting me here and engaging with me. Um, and yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time to be with us today, Alex. All right, so I'm going to now go on and move on to our next candidate uh, who is Reshma Patel. Reshma Patel is a candidate for controller and the president of the Eleanor Roosevelt Democratic Club of Manhattan. She is also the co-chair of the Chaya Community Development Corporation, which serves immigrant communities in Queens that were disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. Thank you so much for being with us today, Reshma. What I'd like to do is begin with a question from Vanessa Fuentes, one of our students here at Hunter College. Uh, Vanessa, are you, are you ready? Hi, thank you so much for coming to this forum today. Um, New York City shelter system is allegedly consistently recognized as the most sophisticated and comprehensive in the nation. Yet many LGBTQI individuals experience physical and verbal abuse once they are in it. If you become controller, what if anything would you do differently to ensure that not only the right to shelter as is now the case, but also that the dignity and respect of every individual, including those who are LGBTQ, is upheld. 
Well, thank you, Vanessa, for that question. And um, thank you all for having me. It's a pleasure to be at Roosevelt House, a virtually a place that I've been to many great talks in person. Um, so it's great to be part of this. And, you know, in New York City, um, we have no specific shelter for the LGBTQ community. Um, we do have uh, nonprofits that serve those communities. And I think that we need to have more supportive, I mean, the end thing should be more supportive housing where LGBTQ members can feel comfortable and have permanent housing as opposed to being a shelter system where they feel unsafe. But within the shelter system, we need to have specific shelters where LGBTQ members can go, but especially LGBTQ youth, because 40% of the youth homeless population is LGBTQ. And they suffer considerably because especially this past year with the pandemic, they were in homes where they weren't accepted, where they couldn't be open with their families, and they were left on the streets or in the shelter system. And I think the end goal, if I were to become controller, would really to be providing housing for them and providing supportive housing so they get the services they need, especially in terms of mental health that arises from them being told by their family that they cannot stay in their homes with them. Thank you so much for that answer. Yeah, thank you so much for that answer. And then also for bringing up the, that 40% of LGBTQ youth are homeless. It definitely makes it one of the top issues in the city at the moment. Um, so uh, my next question is also from a Hunter College student from Asia Soko. Uh, Asia asks, uh, what will you do to ensure that the L that LGBTQ New Yorkers can use their pronouns on local IDs and city forms rather than the sex they were assigned at birth? And is this something that you will advocate for within the Trump Com Comptroller office if elected? Yes. Um, so you know, the controller does not make policy or legislate, but we do make policy proposals. And that is a policy proposal that I would make. And it is a policy proposal that's out there that we should be able to identify by whatever gender pronoun that we want, whatever gender identity that we want. And we want that to be uh, on the NYC ID, on our state DMV licenses and IDs. And that is something that I would advocate for and push for and um, work with our local electeds, uh, the mayor's office, the city council, as well as our state electeds to pass. Thank you so much for that response. Uh, my next two questions are gonna be general questions I've been asking all the candidates. Uh, first, what do you think is the most pressing issue facing the LGBTQ community in NYC? And how do you plan to address it as comptroller? So I think there are many pressing issues, but I would say the most important is this issue of homelessness amongst LGBTQ youth. And I think that we really need to provide more services for them and we need to provide more opportunities for employment for LGBTQ youth. Uh, there is a new program that was started this year called Unity Works, which is gonna provide jobs for about 90 LGBTQ youth, but we need more jobs for them, more apprenticeships, more training, especially if at a young age, they're not being supported by their parents. We need to make sure that they are able to earn an income and to be able to be in safe housing. And we wanna make sure that there's affordable housing available to them. And as I mentioned earlier, supportive housing to help them deal with you know, at such a young age, having to be out in the workforce, having to be living on their own. And I think that's a big issue that we need to deal with. And the, you know, high, there's higher levels of depression and mental health issues with LGBTQ youth um, as a result of the discrimination that they face. And we really need to provide supportive services very specifically for them, as well as 20% of the homeless population that is LGBTQ is HIV positive and make sure that, you know, they have the medicines that they need and the protocols they need to live with HIV. Thank you so much for that response. Uh, and my next question is, what was the first thing you did in support of LGBTQ rights? So um, I, I'm an immigrant from India. I came here as a young age, but it is a community that has not been accepting of LGBTQ community members. And so from a young age, I mean, high school, college, they were always friends who had to hide their identity and I had to be there to support them. Uh, but very specifically in the public sphere, um, in the mid nineties, when I moved to New York City, there is every August is the Independence Day Parade that's organized by uh, many organizations within the Indian community. And I had been a volunteer with a domestic violence organization at that time called Sakhi. And we were excluded because the community didn't want to accept domestic violence as a problem. And the South Asian Lesbian Gay Association, as they were called at the time, uh, was also excluded. And at some point, you know, we would protest every year. And then at some point, they let the domestic violence organization be part of it and said that we could march in the parade. But 
I and other members of our organization chose to protest in allegiance to our you know, South Asian, lesbian, and gay community members who are still being excluded. And we didn't participate until we were all included in that. Thank you so much for that response. It's um, a definitely important uh, protest that you engaged in. Uh, my next question uh, is actually referring to something specific in your uh, campaign platform. Uh, so your campaign platform advocates for investments in accessibility. Uh, a new research from the Movement Advancement Project shows that LGBTQ people are more likely to have a disability than the general population. In one survey of 26,000 transgender people, for example, 39% reported having a disability. As comptroller, what will you do to make the city more accessible? Well, thank you for that question. It's something that I'm deeply committed to. I have family members who have you know, disability issues and it's unfortunate that we have so many subway stations in the city that aren't accessible. And one of the things I serve on my local community board and one of the things that we made sure when this L train modification and uh, upgrade was happening that uh, the stops in our district had elevators and were accessible to everybody. And I want to make sure that we have ADA accessibility. For instance, all our polling stations didn't have it. You know, while we're required to, I would inspect polling stations on election day, and a lot of them, the elevators were broken or didn't have the ramps in place. And so, as controller, I would audit all the city agencies to make sure that everywhere we have accessibility for everyone. And I would also make sure that we have services available because you could have somebody I mean who has the double discrimination right because you have discrimination because you're LGBTQ and you have discrimination because you're disabled and making sure that that is taken into account that you know because you're now facing two challenges as opposed to one in terms of getting employment in terms of having access to health care in terms of having access to housing. Well, thank you so much for that response. Uh, elevator access, I live in South Brooklyn, is, is, is certainly something uh, that, that we've experienced in this area of the city as well as an issue. Um, my next question is about the New York City budget. As I'm sure you are aware, uh, the budget is, is expected to have a $5.25 billion gap um, in the upcoming fiscal year. As Comptroller, what will you do to ensure that services are not cut for LGBTQ people? And what services would you advocate to expand? So the city budget, it, when the preliminary budget came out in January, uh, there was a $5.3 billion gap. But then in April, we got the American Rescue Plan. And that in combined with the American Jobs Act, we, thanks to Georgia and ha us having the Senate majority um, in Washington, we actually are not gonna end this year, or, I mean, or rather this FY22 budget that we're working on right now, will no longer have a $5.3 billion deficit. We'll in fact probably have a surplus because of all the federal assistance we're getting. But that money runs out in 2024. And so we need to plan for what happens after that. And going forward beyond 2024 fiscal year, we have about $4 billion of deficits being projected. And lots of important programs like Universal 3K uh, program or the Unity Works program that I mentioned earlier, or we have 10,000 jobs being created to clean up our city parks. Um, all of those programs are being funded from this federal assistance that we're getting. And we need to make sure that we have recurring revenues and we make a plan so that we can fund these programs after that money runs out because we don't wanna create something and then leave people without the very critical services that we're providing them. So I think that's the big challenge for the city right now to figure out what we do going forward once the federal aid runs out. And one of the things that I've done in my career, um, I've worked in public finance and I worked with the city comptroller's office to generate millions of dollars of savings by restructuring of the debt of the city. Right now with interest rates being low, we should look at restructuring it and generate savings in later fiscal year. So we'll have money and we are not gonna be forced to make budget cuts. The other thing I think we should be looking at is had we not got the federal stimulus money, we would have to make severe cuts. So rather than do that at a time when there's a crisis, now go ahead and see where we have redundancies, where we can achieve savings in our agency audits so that we're not forced to cut critical social services in the future because there is a lot of overlap and we can fix that and get some cost savings. Thank you so much for that answer. In the last couple of seconds that we have left, is there anything you'd like the audience and the LGBTQ community to take away about your candidacy? Well, you know, thank you for your time again today. And I believe that, you know, this past year has shown that we need new leadership, we need new voices. I am running because I believe the voices of my community need to be heard and other communities that I've worked in. And I think that we need financial expertise in the role of controller, which I have, but we also need an understanding of community needs, which I believe I have through the volunteer work I've done in many different communities across New York City. 
All right, thank you so much for that. All right, um, so now we're going to move on to our final candidate, uh, David uh, Weprin. Are you, are you ready, David? Awesome. All right, so- um, uh, I'm ready. <laughs> all right, um, so uh, David uh, Weprin is um, a member of the uh, New York City Assembly uh, representing District 24 in Queens and is running as a candidate for controller. Uh, so David, I'm going to begin by asking you two uh, questions from students. Uh, the first question is from Erta Nazar High. Erta asks, how can the, uh, uh, the government develop a program to secure the LGBTQ plus uh, community's health and safety if they are not welcomed by their family when coming out and, then, and are then faced with homelessness? And how can we effectively use government resources to help LGBTQ adults who are homeless or at risk of experiencing homelessness? Well, very good question. Um, when I uh, chaired the finance committee of the city council from 2002 through 2009, we were actually in two fiscal crises. We were the post 9-11 fiscal crisis and then also the 2008, 2009 recession where we had multi-billion dollar deficits and we turned them into surpluses. Uh, there were a lot of proposals on budget cuts, but uh, I was always a strong advocate uh, for the LGBTQ uh, community uh, in funding. Uh, and I actually uh, did the uh, capital project uh, for the um, LGBT center uh, in the village uh, which uh, was started uh, under, uh, under my uh, watch and uh, we've expanded uh, so many different programs. We did funding uh, for SAGE uh, Senior Centers. Uh, I think it was the first uh, senior LGBT uh, senior center uh, that was started. I, and I provided numerous uh, millions and millions of dollars of funding uh, for the LGBTQ community. So, you know, look, the LGBT and especially LGBT youth uh, who were, you know, contributed to probably the largest uh, amount of people sleeping on the street and uh, homeless youth was a, was a major homeless problem. When I was in the uh, council, I think it's only gotten worse. I don't think, no, I don't think it's gotten better. Uh, and we want to just make sure that, uh, you know, LGBTQ youth uh, and adults uh, are protected uh, despite any potential uh, budget cuts. Uh, you know, I look at them as a potentially uh, vulnerable population and we have to protect our vulnerable population. I would include LGBTQ uh, plus individuals. I would also include uh, some children and, and, and seniors uh, in that category as well. Thank you so much for that answer. Uh, the next question I have is from another Hunter College student is Marilyn Gonzalez. And as Marilyn asks, how would you ensure that LGBTQ youth receive adequate access to mental health counseling and other related resources, especially since many had to quarantine with unsupported family members during the pandemic? Well, we just, uh, again, uh, it's another potential vulnerable population. We have to make sure, uh, you know, that they uh, get the services they need, LGBT uh, Q plus youth, uh, as well as adults. And, uh, you know, I would just uh, do everything in my power as I have uh, during all my uh, government positions, uh, eight years in the city council, uh, 11 years now, 11 plus uh, in the assembly, uh, where I've been a, a strong advocate uh, for funding uh, for, L for the LGBTQ plus community, uh, as well as uh, services uh, for them uh, that are not, mo not monetary as well. Thank you so much for answering those student questions. The next two questions I'm going to ask are general questions that I've been asking of all the candidates. Uh, so the first question is, what do you think is the most pressing issue facing the LGBTQ community in New York City? And how would you plan to address it as controller? Well, you know, the most pressing issue is, um, you know, uh, homeless, homeless youth, uh, because so many, uh, you know, uh, LGBTQ uh, young people, uh, you know, have been rejected by their families, by their parents, uh, and end up having to, uh, you know, live, uh, you know, in the streets or uh, live live elsewhere and uh, go from place to place and uh, potentially uh, homeless shelters. So that's certainly a very uh, pressing issue. Um, so uh, again, uh, we have to make sure we have the funding uh, and we have to uh, particularly pay attention uh, to um, curriculums in, in, in our public schools, uh, but, but specifically when it comes to uh, budgets, 
that we have funding uh, to protect uh, LGBTQ youth and to deal with the, uh, the homeless issue. There should be uh, permanent safe housing uh, for the LGBT community, especially uh, our youth. Uh, and I would make sure that, uh, that that happens. Thank you so much for emphasizing LGBTQ youth and homelessness in your answers. Uh, my next question is more of a, a personal one. Uh, what uh, was the first thing you did in support of LGBTQ rights? Well, you know, I um, can give personal experience of um, uh, people I went to a school with growing up and uh, were supportive of them. And this was a number of years ago because uh, uh, I'm older than some of the other candidates uh, that are running. But I can talk specifically about uh, some of the uh, legislative issues that I've been involved in and, and supported. I've supported almost every LGBTQ uh, plus issue in my eight years in the city council and my uh, 11 and a half years uh, in the assembly. But uh, one of the first acts uh, I was involved with uh, when I was in the city council uh, was actually um, passing um, the recognition uh, of same-sex marriage in New York City. And at the time, there was nowhere in the United States of America that allowed same-sex marriage legally. We, what we did was we passed a bill. I was finance chair, uh, Gifford Miller was speaker. Uh, it was sometime, uh, 2002, 2003 or so, uh, it might've been 2004, it was early on in my uh, tenure. Uh, and the only uh, place that allowed uh, same-sex marriage was the Netherlands at the time. And uh, we actually passed a law that uh, would recognize in New York City, uh, any marriage uh, performed uh, in other jurisdictions, which would be the Netherlands at the time, but in case there were other jurisdictions that did recognize uh, same-sex marriage, uh, you know, we, uh, we recognize them uh, in New York City. So I was proud of that. Uh, and of course, one of my greatest accomplishments uh, was, was playing a, a major role uh, in actually getting uh, marriage equality uh, done uh, in New York City. Uh, something's flashing here. Uh, in uh, passing marriage equality in New York City, that was one of my early votes uh, in, the, uh, in the assembly. And uh, I spoke on the floor. I wasn't just a vote. I was a co-prime sponsor. And I spoke uh, on the floor uh, of the assembly in a very dramatic speech uh, right after um, Assemblyman Dove Hyken from Brooklyn made a, a speech about uh, that this was, uh, you know, comparing, um, you know, uh, same-sex marriages to uh, bestiality and, and other things. And I actually... Uh, made a very uh, dramatic speech after he said, you know, it's against the Torah and all that. And, and I made a point that um, uh, I'm also an observant Jew, uh, but I'm, I also I believe in civil rights. And uh, what we voted on uh, was not, uh, you know, was a civil marriage uh, and uh, no one should be discriminated against. It's a human rights uh, issue. And I made a very dramatic speech that uh, my children uh, were married in uh, Orthodox Jewish ceremonies, they uh, were religious ceremonies, but I don't think anybody should, uh, you know, and, and we did have a time in this country when, uh, you know, intermarriages between, uh, you know, races uh, was prohibited and uh, uh, where as a legislative body, uh, we should be not dictating a religion, uh, you know, to the general public. And uh, this is strictly a civil issue and uh, no one uh, should be discriminated against uh, for loving the person that they want or, or marrying the person they want. Uh, and we're talking about civil marriage, not, uh, not religious marriage. And, uh, you know, I made a kind of a dramatic speech and most, a lot of people attributed my losing a congressional race uh, uh, that year. This was in uh, 2011, beginning of 2011. It was actually towards the end of 2011. And then I ran for Congress for Anthony Weiner's seat when he resigned. And it had a very large Orthodox Jewish population in Brooklyn in particular. Uh, and that was used against me significantly uh, that not only that I uh, voted for uh, marriage equality, but I uh, sponsored it and spoke on the floor. Uh, and uh, most of the political pundits attributed the margin, my margin of loss was due to that issue. But if I had to do it over again, I would do it every time because it was a civil rights issue. It was the right thing to do. Uh, and I'm, I'm very proud of that vote and that speech uh, and that moment uh, in uh, LGBTQ history. Thank you so much for that answer and, so, and for advocating on this when we didn't have a lot of uh, people in government advocating on this particular issue. 
Uh, my next question I'd like to ask you about is about policing. Um, so according to a 2013 report from the Anti-Violence Project, transgender people are 3.0 times more likely to experience police violence and seven times more likely to experience physical violence when interacting with police. As comptroller, what would you do to re uh, reform policing in New York City? Well, I've already uh, done something. Yeah, th oh, that's no, not directly. In, yeah, that's, that's not directly involved in the uh, controller's responsibility. I did do that legislatively in, in Albany by some of the police reform. But I do think um, when uh, if we're auditing the police department uh, and I'm making recommendations uh, on budget proposals, there has to be more sensitivity training uh, in law enforcement in general. And it's not just the LGBTQ uh, population, well, that, that is a major problem, uh, but it's also dealing with other diverse communities, uh, whether it be African-American, Latino, uh, Asian, South Asian, uh, you know, there is, still a lot of uh, discrimination. And I think it's important uh, that we have more programs, more sensitivity training. Uh, I um, have seen a growth even in the police department um, of LGBTQ uh, individuals. I think things have changed. Uh, they are uh, more welcome now uh, than when I first was elected to the city council. I know, uh, you know the uh, police department in general and, and a lot of the other uh, uniform agencies have become much more diverse. Uh, and I think part of that diversity uh, are uh, LGBTQ uh, plus individuals. And uh, I, obviously that's a good thing, uh, but I would a lot of it has to do with uh, making sure that um, there's uh, proper regulations and sensitivity training that don't discriminate against uh, LGBTQ individuals as well as, uh, as other groups. But, uh, you know, I, I think it is changing uh, and I think it is getting better, but, uh, but we're not there yet. Excellent. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. We really appreciate it, um, especially the uh, students in the audience who have been really excited to speak with New York City candidates. Um, and uh, I think that ends our event. Uh, so what I would like to do is just to take the time, time to thank um, every all the candidates for uh, taking time out of their busy schedules, uh, especially as we're in the, the final uh, days of this uh, primary campaign to come and speak with us on LGBTQ issues. I'd, I'd like to thank the audience uh, for coming and listening to um, all the candidates speak about these issues. And I'd also like to thank Harold Holzer, the director of the Roosevelt House for Public, uh, uh, Public Policy Institute uh, for um, uh, giving us a forum for this event, uh, for Mac Barrett and Magdalena Mazurk Nuvo for helping make this event pos possible, and for all of the students who submitted uh, questions and um, such exciting, engaging questions to really help us um, get um, stimulating answers uh, from candidates across the city. Um, I'm going to go ahead and let uh, everyone go now. Uh, this uh, uh, event was recorded and um, should be placed online uh, on, on the website if you're interested in um, uh, viewing it at some later time or if you missed part of it. And um, I look forward to hopefully seeing you all uh, next week, uh, those in the audience at our um, event uh, on the future of LGBTQ representation, where we're going to talk with members of uh, the LGBTQ uh, community who are running uh, for city council. All right, thank you all and I hope everyone has a good night.